Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orphanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. New York City, the number one city in the world. What's happening in the office market? Today, I've assembled owners, developers, you know, people who live, work on New York City to talk about their view of what's happening in the office market. My guests, they include Mark Wasi, who is the chairman of the Tri-State Region for Cassidy Turley. Uh, Bill Elder, who is the executive vice president for leasing for RxR Realty. Michael Cohn, who is the president for the Tri-State Region of Colliers International. And last but not least, Norman Sterner, who is the president and CEO of Murray Hill Properties. Norman, is the office market as good as it sounds? Because people are buying buildings at such high prices in New York. I mean, we haven't seen prices like uh, 767 to sell for 1400 a foot. Uh, you know, the, the Sony- fifty Madison. You know, all of these buildings, how, how do you see it? You've been, you've been a veteran. My partner was on a panel um, at BizNow, and he said it perfectly. He said, when the rest of the world sucks, we look terrific. <laughs> and he said, it is a flight from every foreign capital. If your uh, money were denominated in Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, are you going to sit with that currency? Or are you simply going to move it out and do something better? So that has an effect on the investment sales, which is competition for you guys when you've been buying a lot of property. What's the rental status today? You know, we, we, we know that, you know, Midtown South is, is the hottest neighborhood. Uh, maybe a vacancy of 1.6, it's really low down there. And then there are other sections of town, but we talk about, and we talked a little bit before with Bill about Sixth Avenue, there was a glut of vacant space. And now what are you saying, Bill, what's happening? We think within <clears throat> probably the end of the third quarter, beginning of the fourth quarter, we're going to see substantial erosion of those vacancies by major corporate tenants that are, that are taking big spaces of 250,000 know, feet and above. In fact, I think what it'll do is create kind of a frenzy that uh, people are going to have to scatter and go to other, other vacancies to find replacement uh, homes. Uh, and the good news, you know, that that, uh, that that comes out of all of that, when you look at uh, Sony, who's one of the tenants in play for those Sixth Avenue vacancies, you know, the building that they're leaving behind is going to be repurposed into uh, hotel and uh, and uh, apartments. So that comes out of the. But inventory. don't we have, you know, I, I know that there are a number of buildings at the Trade Center that are, <clears throat> you know, that that we have available space, you know, and you have. Uh, Condé Nast over there, and then you have the, the other company who moved, you were talking before, at Silverstein's property, and then you have other space over there. 
can't they absorb? Plus, we have Battery Park City. You know, we have Brookfield with like three million square feet of space in Battery Park City. Uh, this is why it's dangerous to generalize about the Manhattan market because Manhattan is really an amalgam of sub-markets, each one having a different dynamic. And the Class A market downtown is now one of the most competitive because you do have Silverstein and the Trade Center and Brookfield Place competing for tenants looking for Class A space downtown. But as a perfect example of one of the ironies of New York City and the reason you have to look in a more granular fashion, if you look at the older buildings downtown, there's a flight to them, an exodus of tenants who are being priced out of other parts of the city who are now looking at these beautiful buildings that were built before the war downtown, have gorgeous lobbies, um, quirky but um, light and airy floor plates. But, you know, I always hear, you know, that we need the capability of the younger people want to work in these offices. They want this fancy type of situation, right? You know, younger people want um, to bicycle live, racks, you know, live, a little green. It's, you know? it's all live, work, and play. And that's why you're seeing such an amazing market in that Midtown South market. They want to be there. They want to be where, they can, where they're living, where they're working, where they can play. The, plenty of restaurants, plenty of places to hang out. And the, the marketplace there is the, the spread between that marketplace and Midtown is now just 15%. Five years ago, what do you think it was? It had to be 30%. Try 70%. Yeah. It is dramatic what's going on. There's such a disconnect between Midtown South and Midtown. It's astounding. But here's I would the be thing. willing to bet that if you took out space over 100,000 feet, large floor plates, that the, the rest of uh, the, the space is in single digit sets of vacancy. Well, I would argue that the Midtown South rents that we're getting are greater than many landlords are getting in Midtown, particularly the Grand Central area. And also, you know, to a certain extent, the differences are disguised because Midtown South buildings rent without cleaning and Midtown buildings offer cleaning. Midtown South buildings, the work letters tend to be smaller. It's, very, it's, it's, a, it's a very advantageous market now, and that's why we're seeing capital <coughs> flying into the Midtown South market and a dramatic increase in the cost per square foot. And what about, I mean, Yahoo didn't go to Midtown South. They went to the New York Times building. Um, you know, but look at the character of, of the yeah, building. What I was going to yeah. say before, yeah, yeah. you know, I just want to make a comment on what Michael said. I, totally, totally accurate. I mean, the net effect of rents, Midtown South versus Midtown, in many cases, are much higher, right? So um, that's a very interesting fact. But the other interesting thing to me is, you would talk about, you, you would think that a, 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 a employment force would want to work in a big, kind of fancy, modern office building. But our tenants who uh, live and work in, in the stare at Lehigh's and 626 of the world tell me all the time, this is the environment they want to work in. They want to work in these older buildings, you know, brick facades. And so when you look at the New York Times building, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not hard to draw the correlation of why they're there. You know, when you go inside of the building, it's got uh, the bones but, but that are know, very But you know, Mark brought out before when we were in the green room the discussion mm -hmm. about Eddie Minskoff built a beautiful building. Uh, down in Cooper Union area. 51 which is Astor. 51 Astor, which is a highly regarded area. People want to live there. They want to you know, play over there. And he hasn't been able to uh, secure that right type of tenant yet. It, never count out Eddie Minsky. No, no, I, I, I he, never... He, 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 he builds <coughs> some of the most gorgeous buildings I in town. I never count out Eddie. terrific but, guy. But, but, the, the, Eddie is... is brilliant and he you know he had 101 Avenue, Avenue Americas he was able to find a good tenant over there I don't question about that but you know what there there's a lot of available space we haven't discussed that you know there's been one one and a half million square feet of leasing in Hudson Yards for a building and then there's the discussion that Time Warner will be moving from the Time Warner Center to Hudson Yards so that we're gonna have available one million square feet in Columbus Circle over there and you know, but Eddie's holding out for the for the tenant for the right wants. price. I mean, it, we all know that he was looking at Microsoft. Um, he lost them to Times Square, and it was a price differential that M Microsoft just couldn't couldn't right. uh, give up. And and they are and partially here. leased. I think St. John's is in the building. That was a qu requirement from the city to build the building. And negotiate. So there is now, right? there is uh, uh, either a lease in place or they're negotiating. I've heard that they've actually got some traction right now. Now, now some you other. guys have been one of the most active purchases <laughs> over the last couple of years. We were, 
most of it, it's Midtown and Midtown South. I mean, 626 was over there, uh, but you recently bought more Midtown properties. We were talking about Lower Manhattan. Norman has owned buildings over there. He's operated buildings over there. And, you know, we're, as Michael was talking about the Class B buildings or, you know, these older buildings uh, which have things, how do you look at Lower Manhattan today? Yeah, we're, we're spending a little bit of time down there now looking at opportunities and not really in the uh, kind of Class A trophy category, but more trying to find that B-plus uh, asset that can really uh, fill the need of the tenant that's getting priced out of Midtown and, and predominantly Midtown South who doesn't want to go to the outer boroughs of New Jersey. So, um, you know, when we find something like that at a, at a, at a purchase purchase price that we think you know, makes I, sense, we'd, we'd execute. A week before, I did a show uh, on Brooklyn, and I heard <clears throat> these people talking to me about there's a need for office space in Brooklyn. And I could see a partial need, you know, because people live and work, but I can't see uh, a new office building or large space being needed in Brooklyn in the same manner that suburban space in Westchester and suburban space in Long Island, uh, uh, New Jersey hasn't really done well. It's still the same twelve twenty dollars a foot. Michael, y you can buy buildings downtown, south of Fourteenth Street, for four hundred dollars a foot. You can't buy anything in Midtown for four hundred dollars a foot. Um, w once you do that, you you're able to do forty and forty five dollar rents. You can't do that in Midtown. Uh, as I said, the, the the smaller spaces, the ten to twenty five thousand footers. Uh, they, they can't go to 6th Avenue. Nobody's going to break up a 100,000-foot floor to do that. They can't go to Hudson Yards. Well, what, they can't about, go what about, you know, as I would say, the, the Jeff Garrow 8th Avenue buildings, okay? The buildings, you know, from 34th Street to 40, 42nd Street, you know, those, uh, the, and the side street buildings, you know, the, as we would proverbially say, the garment center, which is no longer in New York City. Uh, what about those properties? Chelsea is gradually creeping northwards. And the bricks are, of course, familiar to the Chelsea occupants, the side street garment center buildings They're and right even on. the 8th Avenue buildings. They're right on. The, the location has terrific transportation, um, but it's not as hip. There's no question, you know, 23rd Street versus, uh, 23rd and 8th versus 34th and 8th. But I think there's an inevitable transition underway because the, the community of employers that are indigenous to Midtown South, are they're growing, um, their population is growing, and they got to go somewhere. I think your case in point is Yahoo. What did Yahoo just do? They just leased 150,000 uh, square feet on 43rd Street. Off Seventh Avenue, Perfect. right? But what and, Bill was saying another... is it, that the bricks over there, the building had a, a feel because it was a yes, that's former exactly New York right. Times building. That's right. That's a but but so... in, in a similar manner, if we talk about what happened in Hudson Square, that you took all the Varick Street buildings and the, the old printing buildings, where you have a lot of communications, uh, publishing companies, uh, the radio stations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, being down there mm -hmm. because of the high ceilings and unusual. Well, it's spaces. also the affordability as well. You know, up until recently, those were thirty and forty dollar deals. Uh, you know, I think the pricing's come up now, but those were, you know, very affordable deals. But also, and the neighborhood is still cool. <laughs> recognize <laughs> that you can't build a pre-war building anymore, right? Oh, um, by definition, right? <laughs> and the supply is in fact dwindling less rapidly today than it was, but there there are still pre-war buildings that are being converted to office, excuse me, to hotel and residential. So you have growing demand and shrinking supply. You know, you relate that, and that relates rather well to this discussion, which I'd like to bring out about this Midtown rezoning. And, you know, these are B buildings, you know, let's say like 317 Madison Avenue or some of these other side street buildings, which are 60 years old, 70 years of age over there. And then some. At least, you know, if you go down Madison Avenue, some of these buildings which are in really miserable shape. What's the thought, you know, as owners, as people involved in this in the city of New York, do you, are, do you believe we should have the rezoning? Do you see it happening? Norman, Michael? You know? The rezoning won't happen now until 2017 to 19, forgetting the war that they'll have um, over the air rights who owns them. Um, 
and it'll take time to take down what's there and to build a new one. So you're talking, you know, anywhere from five to 10 years in the future, but tell me what park they go to um, that, that's close to uh, 45th and Madison. Um, the, the sidewalks are crowded now. Um, the, the infrastructure other than the subway that uh, the, the 2nd Avenue subway or, or, or the new one going to the west side, um, Grand Central's crowded today. Um, what they're not doing, they're, they're trying to sell the air rights. The city is going to get um, a small amount of money, assuming that uh, um, Penson doesn't fight them for who owns them. But isn't it the city is selling air rights in Hudson Square also? Not Hudson Square, Hudson Yards. Uh, someone there's had, room to grow there. Okay, there's room to grow, but you're able, you have transferable air rights that you can utilize for creating development. And the developers are building an extraordinary infrastructure if, if to go along with it. On the west side. On the west side. Yeah, Norman's point is doing. well taken. On the one hand, not every building that was built a half a century ago is an architectural gem. Some of them, it's just their time to come down. So as long as the zoning requires you to build less than you tear down, they're not going to get torn down. That's an impediment to progress. On the other hand, one has to make the leap of faith that if the city increases the population in the midtown core, that they will come up with a means to mitigate the impact on the streetscape, the transportation, but, and but so on. But you know on. what, but what Norman said before, you know, the infrastructure, Hudson Square, uh, Hudson Yards, they are going to have parks. Yes. They're going to have amenities. They, right. It's going to, <clears throat> it'll be light and air and there's transportation over here. Here, you know, Midtown is so com compact now. You walk in Madison, there's no light and air as it is. There's yeah, you nothing. walk around but in the holidays, you can't get around at all. Right. I mean, but that's exactly the point. So you, you've got six or seven years before the next beauty goes up and somebody's getting a rent check. Um, the amenities have to be done. Uh, somebody has to think about, you know, where, where, where they're going to come from, how they're going to stay on the sidewalks, um, where they're going to eat. Uh, how they're going to get to the office yeah uh, i mean right now it's uh, and you know grand central station is the best but yeah, you know you can't walk but you know we, we talk on a straight you, line. you know if you follow the other situation the the, the former fisher brother sites the solo sites can do you see office buildings being possibly bu built on first avenue that seems to be more residentially oriented to me I, I, not i'm not office. disagreeing That's but I'm, you sure. know I'm, and and if you look in reality probably one of the best prices for rent Third Avenue, the rent is still cheap That's on Third right. Avenue. There are bargains on Third okay, Avenue. Okay, sure. Third yeah. Avenue is the discount rent in the city no of New question. York. No question. Yeah. But, but not I the think discount purchase price. No, but the, the rents are... Well, but that's uh, your problem. But New York has to make a decision for the long term. We do need new development. Yes. And are we going to become one of those cities where the core migrates gradually away from its original location? So Grand Central becomes, like I think it did in the 70s, a little before my time, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do recollect going to the uh, Commodore Hotel and Grand Central was not a popular location. So are we going to let Hudson Yards overtake and replace the Midtown Core as we know it today? Or are we going to encourage development and renovation in the Midtown Core of both new buildings and infrastructure to keep pace? You know, it's, it's people, it's, it's a very interesting. I've been spending some time with the Hotel Association and I picked up the newspaper called Hotel, the, their weekly paper, and people would be surprised that the New York Hilton is celebrating its 50th anniversary. So let's understand that 50 years ago, the Hilton, which is the largest hotel in the city of New York, was built. And the office buildings got built. The newer office buildings over there, the 1330, uh, 1345 was later on, but the Time Life building, 1221, these are right. all 50-year-old buildings while they were there. But there was more light and air on 6th Avenue. Well, what you're talking about, there is, you know, you can see some... Well, how about the city making a, a restriction that if you're going to go twice the FAR that's there now, you have to put public space in? It's not beyond the city's capacity. They've no, done they, it before. That's, they should do that. That's absolutely right. Look, it's kind of a tragedy that we consider, Mark and I as brokers, consider... But you're also an owner, so both... Oh, okay, but consider new construction in Manhattan is something that was built in 1990. That's, that's right. considered a that's new building, new. Mm -hmm. right? That's brand new. That's, and, and, that's 20 years ago. But, but you know, the, let's also look at what, what they did at 1330. They, they, they took a building, okay, and they 
resurrected it, okay? It was built over there. They put a lot of money in, and it's a great building, and it doesn't look like, even though it was built probably 45 years ago, right. 50 years late, ago. Uh, late 1960s. There's no question that we have a terrific way in New York of remaking the old. We did it for our building on 60th and Madison, which now has a new skin. But in, in truth, we're, we're doing that. We're cutting and pasting instead of tearing down and rebuilding. But the, the city is not saying not to do that, Michael. Um, I think it's a great idea. I think the, um, the, the older structures cannot have the bandwidth, they cannot have the air conditioning. They, they, we don't even have the electric um, to, to power every one of these new buildings. So tell them you can't go 30 times FAR, you can only go 27, but you got to give public space. People watch from around the world, they want to know about the opportunity. What type of deals can a tenant get to the can they move to Park Avenue? I, you, been, you and I have always had this joke about mm -hmm. Park Avenue Park space. Yeah. Can people acquire property for less than $100 a foot to rent? I'm not talking about a purchase. Oh, surely. On Park surely. There, are sublease Absolutely. there are sublease availabilities in the 50s and 60s per square foot presently. And then there's direct space in the higher aspects of some of these Park Avenue towers where you can do deals for 80, 85, right, right. 90 but, a foot. But don't we also have 280? Uh, Park Avenue, which is going to be predominantly... Those but not deals will be... going to be $100 a foot in that building, well, I think, I, down at the... stay on the lower floors. Bill yeah, was right. talking earlier about the phenomenon of 6th Avenue, about the number of tenants. This is... Tenants perceive it to be a tenant's market, and that's a good thing, frankly, for all concerned, because people are coming out of the woodwork. This is an opportunity to secure space in terrific buildings for a long term at a rental, which we know is going to look favorable five or ten years down the road. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but isn't it reality, if, if, when Norman has been on the show in 2007, 2008, 2007 or six, and, and rents were 100 bucks, $110, I mean, we haven't seen, you know, oh, rents we're like... seeing $200 a foot right. rents. I know, but that's for the, 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 the top. top of GM, the top of... But I'm talking, about, I'm talking about rents which are probably in the $50 range today. We were at $100, so... And aren't wait, tenants? Wait, 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 no, no, no. You saw a hundred dollar rent come down to fifty since two thousand eight. I think you've seen a hundred dollar rent go to seventy. Yeah, what maybe, you've maybe seen seventy is, or eighty. But I don't think the depend on the owner quite and, that great. and the amount of leverage that he had yeah. and what kind of shape he was in. Right. Uh, but regardless of the the actual numbers, we've seen a sharp drop since oh seven in the rents for what I would call Midtown Class A product things that don't overlook the park necessarily. And I think that's what's brought out the feeding frenzy that you were referring to earlier. And I think, um, frankly, in the long run, it's a good thing for the city. We want to retain these large employers. We want Sony to move from, you know, 590, sorry. Um, uh, 550. 550 Five. Madison. Um, somewhere else in the Midtown core. We don't want them to disperse to New Jersey or Westchester. And affordable rents and excellent quality buildings are exactly what keep the Sonys of the world in the Midtown That's core. Right. And let's yeah. not forget yeah. the fact, the whole New York proposition of hiring people who, want, who, who work at Sony, they don't want to work in New Jersey. Or let's yeah. let's, let's, let's be world. realistic. New York City. Do, you, do you think, you know, Panasonic, mm -hmm. if they weren't in New Jersey already, you think if they were in New York City, they would run to Newark, New Jersey to be over there? I mean, Governor Christie... It depends Christie, what they do. Okay, it depends on what the business is. But what New Jersey did with these special credits, you know, the urban credits, they gave these these tenants, these owners, the tenants, great deals that they're basically they're not paying rent. If they had taxes, they didn't pay taxes anymore. It was great incentives over there as long as it's near the subway hub, you know, the, the train hub over there. You know, it's an interesting point. Think about where Manhattan, and particularly lower Manhattan, would be today if the Jersey waterfront didn't have that as of right giveaway. Um, it has been an extraordinary drain on the population on this island. And it's not for me to opine on the pros and cons of municipal incentives, but I can observe that the impact has been extraordinary. And without those incentives, We'd but, have but you, a but you very know, different you bring situation. up an interesting subject, and, and I brought this up recently. You know, the REAP program had had uh, gone away uh, on 6:30, and then the, the governor allowed it to stay for another two years, which was the relocation credit over here. You know, you need certain times credits and incentives, and that's what past administrations that you've seen many years on keeping tenants. Well, what did, look what we did for Lower Manhattan. The incentives are still there for they Lower Manhattan right. today. Yep. And it works. Group M.
Group M's taking a half a million square feet downtown with Larry On Silverstein. Stubbers, right? And what are their incentives? What do they get? Oh, they're going to get, you know, commercial rent, you know, tax is going to be lowered. Their energy costs are going to be lowered. They're getting grants for for employees. Yeah, I mean, they've got a taxes you know, for employee. They're yeah. going to, what is that total package? Seven, eight bucks a square foot that they'll have their, their rent reduced? And for it's the pretty, tenants. It's pretty attractive. And for the tenants that will consider a location like Long Island City, it's, the, the incentives are extraordinary. And it's very interesting because if you go to Long Island City today, to some of the um, larger uh, loft buildings, they look exactly the way Chelsea did when I started in the business just a few years ago, <laughs> <laughs> many years ago. And if you used to walk through a building on 18th Street, and to your left would be an architect, and to your right would be a photographer, and then be a guy doing see, light but Jet, but See, it's easy for JetBlue to move from one section of Queens to Long Island City. MetLife, when they decided to leave Manhattan, they came back. They came problem. back. Okay? They they, wrong, they came wrong back. Wrong kind of tenant. Yeah. Wrong kind of tenant. I think yeah. you will, if you want decent office space for fifteen to twenty dollars a foot, you go to Long Island City, and it's and it's there, and it's a community, and the transportation's great, um, and actually those buildings are starting to see a run up in rents and a run up in values. Very interesting. And what what about Brooklyn? Office oh, space in Brooklyn. Dumbo, yeah. off the charts. Yeah, Brooklyn's, Dumbo. Brooklyn's hot. Right? Brooklyn Navy Yard. They're, they're trying to create a technology uh, triangle there. It's, uh, it's interesting. So what stuff. Have happened? And I, you know, it was Vornado who originally was, you know, bought the site on 125th Street. You know, uh, the parking lot site. You know, yeah. NBA. No, it's now going to be Eichner yeah. bought it. Uh, right. He's going to build the residential. What about, you know, with Columbia, with what's going on in the Columbia Hub and the, uh, you know, the amount of uh, medical uh, advancement, do you see uh, Harlem and north of uh, 96th Street for office and other markets? Maybe biotech, medical, you know, you look at the influx of all the... Uh the, the uh, bioengineering firms that are coming into I town. Mean, uh, I mean, uh, Alexandria is building the second building. <clears throat> okay. Perfect, I, perfect I location. I think you'll see certain uh, exceptions, but I think by and large, at this point, the city, I think, has rightly placed its largest office bet over at the Hudson Yards, where clearly there's momentum, there's transportation, you have some of the, the city's biggest developers involved. And I don't know that you can grow too many new sub-markets from scratch at the same time. You know, New York City, we, we, we are an island, okay? And if, if we hadn't built the original Trade Center, we wouldn't have had Battery Park City because we took the dirt and we, <laughs> we, 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 right. we created it. So th there aren't that much, you know, uh, additional space that we can build over here. So we're limited. We're landlocked over here. So that's part of the reason for this potential rezoning. And if you, if you were a betting man, do you say, do you see that there'll be a, the rezoning? Absolutely. Look, the, the city needs new, high-tech, gorgeous, uh, larger properties. But before you do that, you plan for it. And you plan for it with sidewalks, and you plan for it with amenities, and you plan for it with transportation. And, and right now, and, and the mayor is as good as we've had since I've been around. Um, but nobody's planning for that yet. All he wants to do is push through uh, this additional zoning, and, and nobody's saying, wait a second, what if we don't get all of the other things? Mm. How do we build? Mm. How do you put another 10 million feet there? So I, I think, you know, we've, we've got a pretty good perspective on how the market is, which looks pretty good. Very uh, steady. Uh, it's steady, and, uh, you know, in the third quarter, it looks like it's going to be growing. Uh, the nice thing is Lower Manhattan is finally building up some tenants. The Hudson Yards has picked up some major tenants and certain other things. And if certain other tenants go on, you'll have Joe's property over there and Brookfield's property. And um, the things look bright. And I'd like to thank Mark, uh, Bill, Michael, and Norman. And I'll see you next week.